Hi everyone, the Gazette has a new name. It's now called Nostalgia USA, and each month it's getting better. A real entertainment experience. And within each issue, there will be special pricing on selected oldtimeradiodvd.com collections, only available to our subscribers of the Nostalgia USA. Take advantage today by subscribing at oldtimeradiodvd.com. Nostalgia USA, special pricing. What a combination. Go to Old Time Radio. DVD.com today. You'll be glad you did. Let's now join our featured presentation. The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government by Jefferson Davis. Part 2. Chapter 2. The Convention of 1787. Diversity of Opinion. Luther Martin's Account of the Three Parties. The Question of Representation. Compromise Effected. Mr. Randolph's Resolutions, The Word National Condemned, Plan of Government Framed, Difficulty with Regard to Ratification and Its Solution, Provision for Secession from the Union, Views of Mr. Jerry and Mr. Madison, False Interpretations, Close of the Convention. When the convention met in Philadelphia in May 1787, it soon became evident that the work before it would take a wider range and involve more radical changes in the federal constitution than had at first been contemplated. Under the Articles of Confederation, the general government was obliged to rely upon the governments of the several states for the execution of its enactments except its own officers and employees and in time of war the federal army and navy it could exercise no control upon individual citizens with regard to the states no compulsory or coercive measures could be employed to enforce its authority in case of opposition or indifference to its exercise this last was a feature of the confederation which it was not desirable nor possible to change and no objection was made to it but it was generally admitted that some machinery should be devised to enable the general government to exercise its legitimate functions by means of a mandatory authority operating directly upon the individual citizens within the limits of its constitutional powers the necessity for such provision was undisputed. Beyond the common ground of a recognition of this necessity, there was a wide diversity of opinion among the members of the convention. Luther Martin, a delegate from Maryland, in an account of his proceedings, afterward given to the legislature of that state, classifies these differences as constituting three parties in the convention which he describes as follows quote, one party whose object and wish it was to abolish and annihilate all state governments and to bring forward one general government over this extensive continent of a monarchical nature under certain restrictions and limitations those who openly avowed this sentiment were it is true but few yet it is equally true that there was a considerable number who did not openly avow it who were by myself and many others of the convention considered as being in reality favorers of that sentiment the second party was not for the abolition of the state governments nor for the introduction of a monarchical government under any form but they wished to establish such a system as could give their own states undue power and influence in the government over the other states. A third party was what I consider truly federal and republican. This party was nearly equal in number with the other two, and was composed of the delegates from Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, Delaware, and in part from Maryland, also of some individuals from other representations this party were for proceeding upon terms of federal equality they were for taking our present federal system as the basis of their proceedings 
and as far as experience had shown that other powers were necessary to the federal government to give those powers they considered this the object for which they were sent by their states and what their states expected from them End quote. In his account of the second party above described, Mr. Martin refers to those representatives of the larger states who wish to establish a numerical basis of representation in the Congress, instead of the equal representation of the states, whether large or small, which existed under the Articles of Confederation. There was naturally much dissatisfaction on the part of the greater states, Virginia, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and massachusetts whose population at that period exceeded that of all the others combined but which in the congress constituted less than one-third of the voting strength on the other hand the smaller states were tenacious of their equality in the union of the very smallest one as we have seen had sent no representatives to the convention and the other had instructed her delegates unconditionally to insist upon the maintenance of absolute equality in the Congress. This difference gave more trouble than any other question that came before the convention, and for some time threatened to prove irreconcilable and to hinder any final agreement. It was ultimately settled by a compromise. Provision was made for the representation of the people of the states in one branch of the federal legislature, the House of Representatives, in proportion to their numbers, in the other branch, the Senate, for the equal representation of the states as such. The perpetuity of this equality was furthermore guaranteed by a stipulation that no state should ever be deprived of its equal suffrage in the Senate without its own consent. Footnote 31. Constitution, Article 5. End of footnote. This compromise required no sacrifice of principle on either side, and no provision of the Constitution has in practice proved more entirely satisfactory. It is not necessary and would be beyond the scope of this work to undertake to give a history of the proceedings of the Convention of 1787. That may be obtained from other sources. All that is requisite for the present purpose is to notice a few particulars of special significance or relevancy to the subject of inquiry. Early in the session of the Convention, a series of resolutions was introduced by Mr. Edmund Randolph of Virginia, embodying a proposed plan of government which were considered in committee of the whole House and formed the basis of a protracted discussion. The first of these resolutions, as amended before a vote was taken, was in these words, quote, Resolved that it is the opinion of this committee that a national government ought to be established consisting of a supreme legislative, executive, and judiciary, end quote. This was followed by other resolutions, 23 in all, as adopted and reported by the committee, in which the word national occurred 26 times. The day after the report of the committee was made, Mr. Ellsworth of Connecticut moved to strike out the words national government in the resolution above quoted and to insert the words government of the united states which he said was the proper title he wished also the plan to go forth as an amendment of the articles of confederation that is to say he wished to avoid even the appearance of undertaking to form a new government instead of reforming the old one which was the proper object of the convention this motion was agreed to without opposition and as a consequence the word national was stricken out wherever it occurred and nowhere makes its appearance in the constitution finally adopted footnote thirty two c elliot's debates 
volume five page two fourteen this reference is taken from the republic of republics part three chapter seven page two seventeen this learned exhaustive and admirable work which contains a wealth of historical and political learning will be freely used by kind consent of the author without the obligation of a repetition of special acknowledgment in every case a like liberty will be taken with the late dr bledsoe's masterly treatise on the right of secession published in eighteen sixty six under the title is davis a traitor or was secession a constitutional right End footnote. the prompt rejection after introduction of this word national is obviously much more expressive of the intent and purpose of the authors of the constitution than its mere absence from the constitution would have been it is a clear indication that they did not mean to give any countenance to the idea which scotched not killed has again reared its mischievous crest in these latter days that the government which they organized was a consolidated nationality instead of a confederacy of sovereign members continuing their great work of revision and reorganization the convention proceeded to construct the framework of a government for the confederacy strictly confined to certain specified and limited powers but complete in all its parts legislative executive and judicial and provided with the means for discharging all its functions without interfering with the sovereignty freedom and independence of the constituent states all this might have been done without going beyond the limits of their commission quote, to revise the articles of confederation end quote, and to consider and report such quote, alterations and provisions end quote, as might seem necessary to Quote, render the federal constitution adequate to the exigencies of government and the preservation of the union end quote. a serious difficulty however was foreseen the thirteenth and last of the aforesaid articles had this provision which has already been referred to Quote, the articles of this confederation shall be inviolably observed by every state and the union shall be perpetual nor shall any alteration at any time hereafter be made in any of them unless such alteration be agreed to in a congress of the united states and be afterward confirmed by the legislatures of every state End quote. it is obvious from an examination of the records as has already been shown that the original idea in calling a convention was that their recommendation should take the course prescribed by this article first a report to the congress and then if approved by that body a submission to the various legislatures for final action there was no reason to apprehend the non-concurrence of congress in which a mere majority would determine the question but the consent of the legislatures of every state was requisite in order to final ratification and there was serious reason to fear that this consent could not be obtained rhode island as we have seen had declined to send any representatives to the convention of the three delegates from new york two had withdrawn and other indications of dissatisfaction had appeared in case of the failure of a single legislature to ratify the labors of the convention would go for naught under a strict adherence to the letter of the article above cited the danger of a total frustration of their efforts was imminent in this emergency the convention took the responsibility of transcending the limits of their instructions and recommending a procedure which was in direct contravention of the letter of the Articles of Confederation. This was the introduction of a provision into the new Constitution that the ratification of nine states should be sufficient for its establishment among themselves. 
in order to validate this provision it was necessary to refer it to authority higher than that of congress and the state legislatures that is to the people of the states assembled by their representatives in convention hence it was provided by the seventh and last article of the new constitution that quote, the ratification of the conventions of nine states end quote, should suffice for its establishment between the states so ratifying the same there was another reason of a more general and perhaps more controlling character for this reference to conventions for ratification even if entire unanimity of the state legislatures could have been expected under the american theory of republican government conventions of the people duly elected and accredited as such are invested with the plenary power inherent in the people of an organized and independent community assembled in mass in other words they represent and exercise what is properly the sovereignty of the people state legislatures with restricted powers do not possess or represent sovereignty still less does the congress of a union or confederacy of states which is by two degrees removed from the seat of sovereignty we sometimes read or hear of delegated sovereignty divided sovereignty with other loose expressions of the same sort but no such thing as a division or delegation of sovereignty is possible in order therefore to supersede the restraining article above cited and to give the highest validity to the compact for the delegation of important powers and functions of government to a common agent an authority above that of the state legislatures was necessary mr madison in the federalist says quote, it has been heretofore noted among the defects of the confederation that in many of the states it had received no higher sanction than a mere legislative ratification End quote. this objection would of course have applied with greater force to the proposed constitution which provided for additional grants of power from the states and the conferring of larger and more varied powers upon a general government which was to act upon individuals instead of states if the question of its confirmation had been submitted merely to the several state legislatures hence the obvious propriety of referring it to the respective people of the states in their sovereign capacity as provided in the final article of the constitution in this article provision was deliberately made for the secession if necessary of a part of the states from a union which when formed had been declared perpetual and its terms and articles to be inviolably observed by every state opposition was made to the provision on this very ground that it was virtually a dissolution of the union and that it would furnish a precedent for future secessions mr jerry a distinguished member from massachusetts afterward vice president of the united states said quote, if nine out of thirteen states can dissolve the compact six out of nine will be just as able to dissolve the future one hereafter End quote. mr madison who was one of the leading members of the convention advocating afterwards in the federalist the adoption of the new constitution asked the question quote, on what principle the confederation which stands in the solemn form of a compact among the states can be superseded without the unanimous consent of the parties to it End quote. he answers this question quote, by recurring to the absolute necessity of the case to the great principle of self-preservation to the transcendent law of nature and of nature's god which declares that the safety and happiness of society 
are the objects at which all political institutions aim and to which all such institutions must be sacrificed End quote. he proceeds however to give other grounds of justification quote, it is an established doctrine on the subject of treaties that all the articles are mutually conditions of each other that a breach of any one article is a breach of the whole treaty and that a breach committed by either of the parties absolves the others and authorizes them if they please to pronounce the compact violated and void should it unhappily be necessary to appeal to these delicate truths for a justification for dispensing with the consent of particular states to a dissolution of the federal pact will not the complaining parties find it a difficult task to answer the multiplied and important infractions with which they may be confronted the time has been when it was incumbent on us all to veil the ideas which this paragraph exhibits the scene is now changed and with it the part which the same motives dictate End quote. Mr. Madison's idea of the propriety of veiling any statement of the right of secession until the occasion arises for its exercise, whether right or wrong in itself, is eminently suggestive as explanatory of the caution exhibited by other statesmen of that period, as well as himself, with regard to that delicate truth. The only possible alternative to the view here taken of the seventh article of the Constitution, as a provision for the secession of any nine states, which might think proper to avail themselves of it, from union with such as should refuse to do so, and the formation of an amended or more perfect union with one another, is to regard it as a provision for the continuance of the old union or confederation under altered conditions by the majority which should accede to them with a recognition of the right of the recusant minority to withdraw secede or stand aloof the idea of compelling any state or states to enter into or to continue in union with the others by coercion is as absolutely excluded under the one supposition as under the other with reference to one state or a minority of states as well as with regard to a majority the article declares that quote, the ratification of the conventions of nine states shall be sufficient for the establishment of this constitution end quote, not between all but quote, between the states so ratifying the same end quote. it is submitted whether a fuller justification of this right of the nine states to form a new government is not found in the fact of the sovereignty of each of them making them quote, a law unto themselves and therefore the final judge of what the necessities of each community demand here although perhaps in advance of its proper place in the argument the attention of the reader may be directed to the refutation afforded by this article of the constitution of that astonishing fiction which has been put forward by some distinguished writers of later date that the constitution was established by the people of the united states in the aggregate if such had been the case the will of a majority duly ascertained and expressed would have been binding upon the minority no such idea existed in its formation it was not even established by the states in the aggregate nor was it proposed that it should be it was submitted for the acceptance of each separately the time and place at their own option so that the dates of ratification did extend from december seventh seventeen eighty seven to may twenty ninth seventeen ninety the long period required for these ratifications makes manifest the absurdity of the assertion that it was a decision by the votes of one people or one community in which a majority of the votes cast determined the result 
we have seen that the delegates to the convention of 1787 were chosen by the several states as states. It is hardly necessary to add that they voted in the convention, as in the federal congress, by states, each state casting one vote. We have seen also that they were sent for the sole and express purpose of revising the Articles of Confederation and devising means for rendering the Federal Constitution quote, adequate to the exigencies of government and the preservation of the Union, end quote. That the terms Union, United States, Federal Constitution, and Constitution of the Federal Government were applied to the old Confederation in precisely the same sense in which they were used under the new, that the proposition to constitute a national government was distinctly rejected by the convention, that the right of any state or states to withdraw from union with the others was practically exemplified, and that the idea of coercion of a state or compulsory measures was distinctly excluded under any construction that can be put upon the action of the convention. To the original copy of the Constitution, as set forth by its framers for the consideration and final action of the people of the states, was attached the following words, quote, Done in convention by the unanimous consent of the states present, the 17th day of September, in the year of our Lord 1787, and of the independence of the United States of America, the twelfth, in witness whereof we have hereunto subscribed our names, end quote, followed by the signatures of George Washington, President and Deputy from Virginia, and the other delegates who signed it. This attachment to the instrument, a mere attestation of its authenticity, and of the fact that it had the unanimous consent of all the states then present by their deputies, not of all the deputies, or some of them refused to sign it, has been strangely construed by some commentators as if it were a part of the Constitution, and implied that it was done in the sense of completion of the work. But the work was not done when the convention closed its labors and adjourned. It was scarcely begun. There was no validity or binding force, whatever, in what had been already done. It was still to be submitted to the states for approval or rejection. Even if a majority of eight out of thirteen states had ratified it, the refusal of the ninth would have rendered it null and void. Mr. Madison, who was one of the most distinguished of its authors and signers, writing after it was completed and signed, but before it was ratified, said, quote, It is time now to recollect that the powers of the convention were merely advisory and recommendatory, that they were so meant by the states and so understood by the convention, and that the latter have accordingly planned and proposed a constitution, which is to be of no more consequence than the paper on which it is written, unless it be stamped with the approbation of those to whom it is addressed. End quote. Federalist number 40. The mode and terms in which this approval was expressed will be considered in the next chapter. End of chapter 2. Recording by Bill Mosley, Bernardo, Texas, USA.